Hello. Please hit like button and subscribe my channel. Also press bell icon for future video notifications. Thanks. In the middle of 2020, Alex Lucas deliberately infected himself with intestinal worms. The procedure was pretty straightforward. He used a band-aid to press a few larvae of the New World hookworm, Nicator americanus, gently onto his forearm, and waited for the microscopic critters to burrow on in. Although it wasn't painful, exactly, he describes a tingly feeling like little tiny electric shocks as these guys go through your skin, he says. It's intensely itchy for a number of days and then that resolves. Some people who undergo this process experience stomach discomfort when the worms arrive in the gut, where they will grow up to one centimeter long, but many will then never have any other clue that they're infected. There were several re. For one thing, his research at James Cook University in Australia focuses on multiple aspects of N. Americanus biology, and as obligate human parasites, these intestinal worms just don't grow very well outside of people. Rearing a few in his own gut and then collecting eggs via a bathroom visit would be a lot simpler than trying to maintain a population in the lab, Lucas explains. Judging by how many eggs he's currently shedding, he estimates it's around 20,000 per day. His worms seem to be doing just fine. Closing parenthesis. Lucas has also, in the course of his research, developed the view that infection with N. americanus and other intestinal helminths, which together are thought to inhabit at least 2 billion people worldwide, isn't always harmful. In fact, he argues, work by his group and others indicates that there could be some unique benefits to controlled, low-level infection with certain worm species, particularly for combating so-called Western diseases, including allergies, autoimmune disorders, and various other inflammation-related C. As an advocate for exploring helminth infection as a potential therapy against such conditions, Lucas realized he had to give it a go. I'm sitting there telling the world how great this is, he recalls thinking. I should probably experience it for myself. People still believe that there are good immunological reasons for continuing to pursue this. It's a strategy born of necessity for a large, multicellular parasite that typically persists months or years in a single gut and, unlike a bacterium or virus, can out-multiply its host's defenses, says Rick Mazels, an immunologist at the University of Glasgow and Lucas's former postdoc advisor. Until a century or so ago, when improved hygiene and healthcare began to wipe out worm infections in industrialized countries around the world, the whole human population would have had these parasites for most of their life, Maisel says. They've had all the time in the world to adapt and to learn how best to live in the environment. This intimate biological relationship forms the basis for the argument made by Maisels and others that helminths play a crucial role in keeping harmful immune responses in check, and that they're loci. Previous attempts to convert this line of thinking into therapies for immune-related conditions have had mixed success. There's been disappointment over the results of the trials, says William Harnett, an immunologist of the University of Strathclyde in Scotland who is named as an inventor on patents covering the therapeutic use of some worm-derived molecules. Remarkably, the man's ulcerative colitis seemed to be in remission. So Loke began studying the man's physiology, using colonoscopy images and intestinal biopsies, some of which had been collected prior to the egg swallowing and others afterward. We followed him for a few years and really characterized what was happening in his gut, says Loke, now with the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases in Maryland. It looked like worms were restoring the mucosal barrier. The value of such one-off studies is limited from a therapeutics point of view. They are just case reports, says Loke. You don't really know how broadly applicable it is. But they do help researchers piece together the mechanisms by which helminths modify human biology, as do complementary studies on animals infected with worms. See illustration on page 30. In his view, 
intestinal worms essentially, decide that they're a transplant, he says. They walk in and assimilate themselves as if they were a normal part of the body. Several of the mechanisms Maisels has studied operate via regulatory T-cells, or TREGs for short, specialized immune cells that typically dampen immune responses. Human studies, for example, have found higher levels of TREGs in the blood of people infected with N. americanus or the large roundworm Ascaris lumbricoides compared with worm-free controls. Last year, scientists in the UK reported findings from a randomized controlled trial of N. americanus infection as a therapy for relapsing multiple sclerosis. As predicted, worm infection boosted TREG levels in people's blood, the researchers reported. There were also fewer relapses among hookworm infected people than in the placebo group, though this finding wasn't statistically significant. Earlier this year, he and his colleagues published data from a study of mice-fed fatty or sugary diets. Animals infected with the nematode Nipostrongylus brasiliensis had higher levels of anti-inflammatory cytokines such as IL-4 than uninfected controls and were protected from diabetes-like patholo. The team is using hot sauce to simulate the tingly feeling of burrowing larvae on the arms of people in the placebo group. Despite this progress, results from the latest handful of clinical trials haven't been hugely encouraging. A small randomized controlled trial of celiac patients published earlier this year by Lucas and colleagues, for example, failed to find a positive effect of hookworm infection on gluten tolerance when people consumed moderate amounts of the protein, although when given questionnaires about their X. An earlier, smaller trial led by the same group had suggested a beneficial effect of worm infection on gluten tolerance, but it wasn't placebo-controlled. I think that's the part that's really difficult, Loke says of the placebo effect in Helminth therapy studies. Before we started to do trials, I never really appreciated how strong the placebo effect can be. Moreover, he adds, the complexity of worm-host interactions makes it hard to know whether a negative trial result means a helminth therapy is completely ineffective, or just that the treatment only he. One way to resolve this puzzle could be to learn more about variation in immune system responses to helminths, something that Loke is working on now. Another may be to take the worm, a multicellular animal with its own life cycle and behavior, out of the equation. Deciphering how these proteins interact with the mammalian immune system is a mammoth task, and some research groups have decided to focus on characterizing the form and function of specific peptides that seem likely to have therapeutic properties. At the molecular biochemical level, it's interfering with the immune system cell's ability to produce inflammatory responses, he explains. This happens in quite a range of cells, including macrophages, dendritic cells, and mast cells as well as B cells and T cells, and at least in some cases depends on toll-like receptor 4, TLR4, a protein on these cell surfaces. The team has been testing the molecule in animal models of disease. Last year, for example, the group reported that S62 extended health and lifespan in some mice fed a high-calorie diet throughout their lives. We got some really interesting data from that. Harnett says, adding that although both male and female mice showed better health with worm treatment, only male mice lived longer, for reasons the team doesn't fully understand. The University of Strathclyde recently secured a licensing agreement with the U.S.-based company Vimalaya Therapeutics, Vimalaya, means, parasite, in Swahili, which will aim to develop drug candidates for cutaneous lupus, he says. That's just taken off in the last few months. Gut guest scientists are only just beginning to understand how parasitic helminth worms inhabiting the mammalian intestine and other tissues manipulate their hosts. In at least some cases, helminths may help dampen inflammation, and researchers are pursuing new therapies for autoimmune and inflammatory conditions that tap into worm-mediated signaling. A selection of the species some of which infect animals other than humans, and proposed mechanisms, based mainly on in vitro and animal studies, are illustrated below.
Gut barrier infection with Trichuris trichiera may stimulate CD4 plus T cells to produce cytokines such as IL-22 associated with mucin production and gut wall protection. See full infographic. Web PDF other groups have zeroed in on compounds secreted by Heligmosomoides polygyrus baccarii, an intestinal parasite of rodents. One international team recently found that mashed-up H. polygyrus larva dampened the activity of various immune cell types in vitro. Using a series of assays including heat inactivation and chromatography to identify active ingredients in the mixture, researchers picked out the enzyme glutamate dehydrogenase as one protein that could be responsible for some of the worm juice's effects. Additional H. polygyrus peptides include H. piari which blocks certain inflammatory pathways by neutralizing the cytokine IL-33, and HPTGM, which mimics the mammalian protein TGF-beta and which Maisels and colleagues found to activate a pathway that upregulates TREGS. That's turned into a really fascinating story, Maisel says, noting that the protein contains several mystery structures in addition to the TGF-beta mimicking part that the team thinks might be involved in determining where HPTGM goes. So it has both an address and a message, if you like. The therapeutic potential of HPTGM is still unclear, however. For groups less focused on specific molecules or mechanisms, there's also the brute force approach to identifying promising worm-derived drugs. There's a whole bunch of proteins that got a check mark in that screen. And some of them were things we might never have thought about beforehand, says Lucas, who recently co-founded the startup Macrobiome Therapeutics to further his Helminth therapy work. Many species have yet to be examined, so it's possible that there's a lot of treasures we didn't come across yet. Indirect effects of Helminth infection While most researchers in this field have been focusing on direct interactions between worms and their hosts, several who spoke to the scientists. Increasingly seen as a mediator of human health in its own right, with hypothesized effects on everything from intestinal inflammation and immune development to cancer progression and mental health, the gut microbiome could also be an important piece of a worm's relationship with its host. Part of her work examines how worms react to the gut microbiota. Some of the team's latest mouse data suggest that at least some worm species are much, much happier without any bacteria around it at all, Harris says. Indeed, work by several groups suggests that the microbiota seems to be required for some of the beneficial consequences of Helminth infection. Increasingly seen as a mediator of human health in its own right, the gut microbiome could also be an important piece OFA worm's relationship with its host. The results were interesting, Loke says, because parasitic infections, at least, Harmful ones, are typically associated with lower bacterial diversity. Evidence for a potentially causal link comes from experimental work in animals and humans. Harris Group has found that infection with helminths such as H. polygyrus can completely remodel the gut microbiota in mice, for example. And in a clinical trial of celiac patients carried out several years ago, Lucas and colleagues reported that experimental infection with N. americanus led to a small but statistically significant increase in the number of bacterial species detectable in the human gut, though community structure and. She highlights a 2019 study from Harnett's group reporting that S62 protected mice from rheumatoid arthritis, an autoimmune disease that causes gradual bone erosion and that has previously been associated with disrupted gut microbiota. Monitoring the composition of the gut microbiome, the researchers also found that S62 treatment promoted growth of certain Clostridialis bacteria that produce butyrate, a metabolite previously shown to promote bone formation and prevent bone loss in mice. The relatively recent discovery that worms secrete some of their proteins within extracellular vesicles that are taken up wholesale by host cells, for example, represents a previously unappreciated way for worms and hosts to communicate. Following one of the team's celiac trials, some patients had what a celiac pathologist would call fully blown disease, but these people didn't feel unwell, Lucas says.
When trials end and participants are offered a deworming drug, many refuse it, he adds. A number of people refer to the worms as their families. And what about Lucas? Would he kill off his parasites? I'm over 50 now and I felt like my knuckles were starting to feel slightly arthritic, and I thought, oh, I wonder if the worms will do anything for them. Acknowledging that it's just an anecdote, not a scientific insight, he says he thinks his knuckles have been feeling slightly better. I don't know if it's due to the worms, he says. But I'm not getting rid of them in a hurry. Agent on the inside Nicator Americanus courtesy of Alex Lucas in addition to their potential as macrotherapeutics, helminths have caught the attention of organizations interested in developing ways to augment human biology. The project, supported by Charles River Analytics as part of a contract with the U.S. government's Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, aims to take our worms which have been shown to be safe and well tolerated and can be genetically modified using techniques like CRISPR, and actually. In the long run, he adds, it might even be possible to engineer worms to release drugs to combat disease. Before, you just had the parasites in the body producing their own goodies, but now we can engineer them to secrete foreign molecules, he says. My goal one day is to have a worm that's genetically modified to secrete an anti-inflammatory monoclonal antibody into the gut that might cure inflammatory bowel disease, for example. Quote. Please support my channel to grow by pressing subscribe button and the bell icon. We will notify you technological news. Thank you.